Go Catch a Goose, a My Hero Academia fan fiction. Two years after UA graduation, pro heroes Deku and Aravati are good friends, but nothing more. That is, until Deku falls for a vicious prank text and a rom-com ensues. Originally posted on zemashi.wordpress.com. Prologue Take number one. Toto, Todoroki, is a portrait of apathy. He stands behind his kitchen table, lined with an assortment of mismatched food items, his expression flat as if he's fallen asleep with his eyes open. As a professional hero who's experienced... A woman's sigh is heard off camera. Shoto, try smiling or people will ask questions. The video is cut short and deleted. Take number three. One egg, five cloves of garlic, a lime, miso paste, low-fat, sugar-free chocolate yogurt, a tuna filet, charred black and still smoking, ketchup, and espresso, wasabi, a blender. Toto Todoroki is a seething vessel of rage. While amusing to behold from the safety of a faraway screen, in person, the plunging temperature gives goosebumps to the bravest souls. A spirit of loathing has reignited in the professional hero who has faced much worse. Joto, smile. His focus lifts up and over the lens, and a nod signals his agreement. Joto smiles like he's swallowed a slug. He hasn't swallowed anything yet. Take number 18. Joto Todoroki is a heartthrob, the fire and ice prince. A ghost of a smile graces his lips as he speaks. I'm making a smoothie. Go Catch a Goose, Chapter 1 The first time someone asked, it was out of concern. Ochiko was barely settling in at Gunhead Hero Agency when she found her fellow sidekicks, Zip, Silvertooth, and Hatchet, huddled together in front of an office PC. Zip sucked in a hiss through his teeth. What did he say on that one? Just keep up the good work. Hatchet tilted his head. About as generic as you can get, if there weren't too many other comments. That other one, before, about her snow cone is a bit too friendly, don't you think? Zip pointed at the screen. But I guess there's always those people who have to comment on food. She does have a snow cone. All your pictures look great. Are you sure it's the real guy, not some poser? I checked his profile, Silvertooth said. It looks legit, but you can't be sure. Like I said, he only commented on her pictures and the album's been up for less than a day. And I mean, every time Gunhead's hired a girl, there's some weirdo commenting on her picture. Zip shrugged. We can block him. Hatchet crossed his arms. I don't know. It's a lot of comments, but none of them are weird by themselves. Some of them seem more like... Realization flashed across his features, and he called out from across the room. Hey, Aravity, you went to UA. Do you know Deku? Yeah, he's in my class, or was, I guess, since we graduated. Ochiko slid over to see what they were all talking about, which was an agency social media page showing 136 notifications from Deku between 2 and 3 a.m. and immediately turned beet red. He must have liked every photo they uploaded. Oh my gosh, he never sleeps. Yes, he's my friend. I swear, he does this with everyone he knows. It wasn't always friendly. Every other Monday, Ravity taught a quirk safety class at a local elementary school. A boy, no older than nine, approached her after one of these classes. She should have been more suspicious of his deadpan question. Hey, do you know Deku? I do happen to know him. He? You're a liar. What? Prove it, or you're lying. There's no way every hero knows Deku, but you dumb adults think we're too stupid to figure it out. My dad says heroes are all liars who use villain conspiracies to steal our taxes. Do you know Santa, too? Occasionally, he came out of nowhere, and with presents. Ochiko answered her doorbell to find an elderly woman whom she'd seen around the apartment complex. Her wrinkles lit up, and with no further explanation, she asked, Young lady, do you know Deku? Deku? Yes, ma'am. He was in my class at UA. And Ochiko was bewildered to find a brown paper sack pushed into her hands. He seems like such a nice young man. Here, I grew these cucumbers on my veranda. Who 
please take them. Ochiko wasn't the least bit surprised to see him. She'd gone to the convenience store for food after a late shift when the mess of green hair flashed in the corner of her eye. Her head turned as if a string pulled her nose. The magazine rack was across the store by the wide wall of windows, all but a one-way mirror at 12.45 a.m. The contrast made the colors pop, and she spotted Deku in an instant. She saw Deku way more in the media than in person. His hair, name, and face were staples at the newsstand, regular occurrences on TV, unavoidable on the internet, and clearly she didn't get in and out of a convenience store without catching him. Fully expecting to see him didn't stop her from looking. Every. Single. Time. What was the crease bra look the clerk gave her when she handed over a copy of Heroes Junior? That one question on the tip of the tongue. The clerk had to recognize her by now. She visited this store while the guy was on shift, both in and out of costume, at least three times a week. Do you know Deku? It was silly to volunteer the information. She'd come off as pig-headed if she went around calling someone so famous her friend. But if someone else brought it up, suddenly everyone wanted to listen, and he was so much fun to talk about. Getting him to dance badly in the dorm common area on unofficial karaoke night. Or that one time, three minutes before their English homework was due, when he said he'd grabbed the essay she'd forgotten in her room and somehow left the place looking like he'd been hit by a typhoon. He'd apologized every day for a week. Or rather... The clerk's odd expression was in response to a grown woman smiling to herself as she purchased a children's magazine in the middle of the night. She couldn't help it. Magazine Deku looked so happy. He'd had to loosen up in practice before he could take those pictures. Really, she remembered back when instructed to pose for the camera, he acted like said camera wore a loaded gun. But Heroes Jr. had to make eye contact, flash a peace sign, and grin like the sun. And if Otsuko saw him smile like that, there was no keeping his joy from mirroring off her face. It was weird, fun, and exciting to see someone she knew become wildly famous and successful. Back in high school, Ochiko knew Deku was going to be big. Anyone who had classes or training with him knew his quirk was insane from the get-go, smashing buildings and his own bones in the process. When he learned to control it, he was the undisputed top of the class. Yet, she didn't realize how big he'd be. Deku was too familiar. Ochuko couldn't fairly judge a friend she saw practically every day for three years. This was the guy with the All Might collection and habit of mumbling his thoughts out loud, so she'd been startled when his name actually hit the charts. Number one hero at 19 years old. By unofficial rankings, it was 18. Dinner and Heroes Jr. found themselves on the short table in Ochuko's living room. On the magazine cover, Bright bubble letters boasted an interview with Deku and an exclusive holographic hero card, likely the reason why the magazine was wrapped in plastic. Hero merch required protection from sticky little fingers. The whole thing felt like nostalgia in more ways than one. She had hundreds of low-resolution pictures of Deku smiling like this on her old flip phone. The new smartphone sitting next to her half-eaten binto had a fancy camera, but... Pictures of friends were harder to come by. Deku was near the top of Ochiko's recent messages. She pulled him up and typed, Deku, I saw you on Heroes Jr. and got a copy. But it sounded kind of lame written out. For the first thing he'd see in the morning, she could do better. Deku, I saw the world's greatest hero rockin' the cover of Heroes Jr. and had to get a copy. You're so cute when you smile. The message waited while Ochiko found the interview. She didn't know what she expected, but flipping past a hero quiz, a story about insect quirks, and reader's fan art, she remembered why she hadn't picked up this magazine in 10 plus years. The exclusive interview was a series of questions, as voted on by readers. 1,109 children wanted to know how to become a hero. Deku took two paragraphs to say train really hard. 1,182 asked if Deku fought a T-Rex, who would win? A column of analysis was too much. T-Rex didn't stand a chance. Favorite animal? He liked dogs. Favorite food? An anecdote from childhood. Katsudon. Favorite color? Red. Wait, his favorite color was red? 
Didn't Deku like green? His costume was green. Hadn't that been his idea? Come to think of it, his dorm room had been covered in red and blue all might everything, hadn't it? Maybe Ochiko didn't know him as well as she thought. Question. What is the most embarrassing thing that has happened to you? 1,060 votes. Deku. Most embarrassing thing? There's a lot. I don't know what the most embarrassing thing is. Let's see. Well, the first time I went on a talk show, it was with several other heroes. I didn't know they were filming that day, so I came in shorts and a t-shirt and everyone else was in costume. The host made a big joke out of it and had me show my license to the camera to prove I wasn't a random person. And about a week ago, uh, I forgot my wallet at home and went to lunch. A fan recognized me and paid for my food, then they wanted my autograph. I was so embarrassed. I still need to write a thank you note. Oh, one of the worst had to be in first grade when our class was practicing for the school play. Right before I went on, I spilled apple juice on myself and my friend, uh, we can call him K-chan, said I peed on stage in front of everyone. I didn't want to go to school for weeks. And another time, when I was still at UA, I had plans to meet All Might, but he gave me the wrong address. 101 instead of 110 or something like that. So I went into the building and told the receptionist, I'm here to see All Might. And of course he wasn't there, but I thought they thought I was a fan or something, so I kept insisting. If it had been Mr. Tanaka or something, you just figure I had the wrong address, but I'm here to see All Might. Sounds like I was crazy or playing a joke, so they threatened to call security followed by bold letters in parentheses. Ask mom or dad to visit Heroes Jr. online for Deku's full answer. Ochiko snorted and added to the text, OMG, your interview, I'm dying. Half of it is your embarrassing stories and there's more online? They asked a question, not your whole life story. You're really good with kids though, I bet they'll love it. Flipping the page signaled the end of the interview with more pictures from the photo shoot. Here, a shiny hero card was wedged into the magazine, which she picked up with a, Oh, how was that for an action pose? The image moved, a mid-air kick, Deku crackling with green energy that changed with the angle of the lights. Ochiko tilted it back and forth, impressed. She didn't remember hero cards being this cool when she was a kid. Back then, every other card was all might, posed with a fist up in victory or hands on the hips. Nothing near as dynamic. It was crazy to think kids these days didn't actually remember All Might before his retirement. They all love Deku. Super cool hero card. 10 out of 10 for the lightning effect. Ochiko would tell him if he were here. Sign it for me and I can sell it. But he lived an hour away and it was way too late. So she settled for a paragraph typed up with her thumbs. Ochiko stacked the card and magazine on the table and snapped the picture as an attachment. She wished she could see his reaction. Cute when you smile would embarrass him when he read it in the morning. Ochiko's fingers hovered over the screen. Was it too much to say? No, Deku was her friend and she said things like this to her friends all the time. I miss you. Send. Deku's stuff had a shoebox under the bed. It was getting a bit too full, with the lid balanced at an angle rather than properly closed. Ochiko would have to upgrade her storage or stop getting stuff. Sitting on the bed, Ochiko unpacked the whole box to fit Heroes Jr. flat on the bottom. The largest offender was a t-shirt that said t-shirt. Folded and rolled into a tight ball, it claimed a quarter of the space. A mug styled after his costume was the second biggest. Then she had keychains. Three Deku themed in one all night, a fuzzy green plushie that wasn't merch but looked enough like his hair to end up in the box, a stack of photos printed from her flip phone that included Ida, Tsuyu, and Todoroki as well, two other hero cards, and a magazine that covered his debut. Tucked inside the debut feature was a handwritten get well note he left four years ago when she caught the flu, hidden twice because keeping it was weird. Her phone buzzed on the nightstand. One message from... Why wasn't she surprised he was awake? Izuku Midoriya. You weren't supposed to buy that! Ochiko doubled over in snickers and sent her reply. You're welcome. Better hope Kei-chan doesn't see it. Moving ellipsis points appeared by his name, paused, restarted, and stopped again. She could practically see him hiding his face in his hands. The screen lit up with an incoming call. 
She put him on speakerphone while she reorganized the box. Hi, Deku. What are you doing up at two in the morning? I didn't think anyone I knew would read a kid's magazine, he said. It was adorable to hear how you'd smash a T-Rex. Adorable? He squeaked. But really, shouldn't you be asleep? Ah, caught red-handed, his voice trailed off. I was just reading some forums when I got your message. Hmm, Ochiko hummed. Can't sleep? Well, you're awake. A nervous laugh carried over the line. I don't get up until eleven. You're gonna get sick. Yeah, I know. Sorry. She savored a moment of silence as she re-rolled the t-shirt up tight. It went back in the box, covering the bright smile on Hero's junior. I thought it turned out well. Cute cover, goofy stories kids can relate to. They'll think you're the coolest. You don't really have to try, though. You're amazing with kid stuff already. I don't know many heroes who can pull it off. You don't think it's weird to be marketed to kids? Well, if you put it that way, she teased. But I haven't looked at the online section yet. Did your house arrest it with K-Chan make the embarrassing stories list? No, he sounded offended. I wouldn't say that in an interview. People would figure out who it was. Butchako cackled. As if you couldn't already tell? K-Chan isn't subtle, you know. You wouldn't know if you didn't know him. Besides, it's different when you're seven. I'll give you that. Do you really think the interview turned out okay? Of course. Thanks a lot, Nadalaka. Though they hardly talked about anything important, he stayed on the phone for another hour. The weather was mentioned. Hopefully the summer wouldn't be too hot. Kirishima and Mina's wedding invitation came in the mail. Mina had insisted all the girls check for it daily, spamming the group chat with sappy pictures and reminders. Ochiko was proud to say her parents were leaving for Europe next week. They'd finally given in to persuasion and allowed their daughter to send them on a trip. In turn, Deku forwarded food pictures All Might had sent from Thailand, and the minutes dissolved talking about other people's vacations. Back in school, she and Deku almost never talked on the phone. Text? Sure. Talking was usually done in person, a natural consequence of sharing the same classes, training, meals, dormitory. Then, school was over, and the students who had seemed glued together scattered across the country to their new lives and careers. Long-distance friendship was different. There were people you decided to call, and people who faded out of your life because you didn't talk anymore. Most of Ochiko's former classmates fell in the second category. In fact, she could count the boys she still talked to on one hand. A few weeks after graduation, she hadn't thought that far ahead. She called Deku for no better reason than to test out video chat on her new smartphone, or because t-shirts that said t-shirt were on sale at the mall. He'd talk if he wasn't busy. About the time Ochiko wondered if she was imposing. He was soon to be the official number one hero, and she had a habit of invading other people's personal space. He started calling back. He didn't call every day, but certainly often. At least as often as her parents. Maybe even more than Suyu. She didn't question why he wanted to talk to her. They were friends, and imagining anything else was a waste of emotion. It was a little weird when their conversations occurred at 2 a.m., but Ochiko didn't... didn't want to care. She had a late work schedule. He was an insomniac. If they wanted to talk, why not? Eventually, Deku admitted he was tired and they said goodnight. Ochoka put the box back under her bed. Gravity's days as a gunhead sidekick were simple and routine. Hero-related duties included training, patrol, and incident response. No hero license required. She shoveled paperwork, phone duty, public relations, and escorted nosy auditors around the office. Since she'd been employed, the agency had handled the weekly average of two cases of illegal quirk use or small-time villainy, of which exactly zero compared to the disaster-level confrontations she experienced in high school. Which was a very good thing. But when one day bled into the next, Ochiko wondered what she was doing with her life. Two years flew by in an instant, and she hadn't accomplished anything. Honestly, whether forward, back, or off to the side, the world kept spinning and she hadn't moved an inch. To suggest that her job wasn't properly heroic, the other sidekicks laughed it off with their own complaints. The traitorous neighboring agency wanted to renegotiate night shifts, 
They let Gunhead order the coffee and it tasted like dirt. Wasn't it great to have crime rates down to all my era levels? And her dear parents were already so proud of their pro hero daughter that they expected nothing else. Maybe her crazy years in high school warped her view of the profession, but still. Ochiko thought Hero spent more time saving people and less time in the agency break room talking about TV dramas. Boring routine set aside, she liked her agency. Gunhead and his sidekicks were both professional and super friendly. Their reputations were swift, clean responses to incidents deterred would-be trouble. She really liked the pay. Even after rent, groceries, utilities, and cash sent home to her parents, Otsuko had never seen so many digits in her bank account. If she could only remember, the ordinary wasn't bad. Still boring, but not bad. The day after Otsuko picked up Hiro's junior, Deku texted her the likes of, What's your schedule? It was the most exciting thing that had happened in two weeks. She worked the evening shift, had Wednesday, Thursday off, and would return to daytime hours in June just in time to suffer the humidity. Deku ran his own agency and chose his own hours. As a matter of avoiding crowds, Wednesdays were convenient for him. He wanted to meet up. Otsuko actually saw him fairly often. Not as much as the cameras, but that said more about the media than how much Deku kept up with friends. They ran into each other at hero-related events, and he always joined in for karaoke or bowling when Suyu was in port. It would be only the two of them today, though. Usually, they met up in a group, but short notice on a Wednesday meant no one else was coming. He beat her to the restaurant by two minutes. A text said he had a table, so she set out to find him. This particular spot was a cheap conveyor belt sushi chain. They had chosen the neighborhood to split the travel distance between them, and among the options in the area, Otsuko had a good guess why Deku favored this restaurant. Ceiling high booth dividers offered privacy, and picking food off of a conveyor belt or ordering from a touchscreen minimized contact with the staff. A few tables were occupied, but for the most part, Wednesday was a quiet evening. Deku would most likely be in the back, wearing a hoodie or a hat, sometimes a face mask. So Otsuko weaved her way around, checking the faces of customers. She was careful not to stare because a fellow with similar stature could easily be a complete stranger. On the way to a far corner, she heard from behind, Uraraka? He could have hidden all day if he stayed quiet. Deku had scooted well inside the booth, so that, famous hero or not, he was impossible to spot from the wrong angle. Not to mention, off-duty Deku did not look like the magazine version. She'd seen the fake glasses before, round plastic frames that hid half his face. His white button-down shirt could have belonged to anyone. No hat today. Instead, Otsuko clapped a hand over her mouth. What did you do to your hair? To which Deku fiddled with a clump of bangs. It's temporary dye and hair gel. What do you think? Green was currently a shiny, shiny black. The usual fluff was smothered out of existence and coned flat. Without the volume, long strands covered his ears, hung over the fake glasses, and he lost a few centimeters in height. Gawking, Otsuko leaned over his side of the table. The hand over her mouth went for his hair. Deku froze up like a statue, but tentatively allowed a pat on the head. The shine had Otsuko expecting something oily, but his hair was solid stiff with product. It's crunchy! Otsuko pulled back, jaw still hanging. And like, wow, it really doesn't look like you. So it'll wash out? Yeah, it comes out. Gets kind of messy, though. But you think it really looks different? Definitely! Otsuko nodded sharply. Like, if I didn't really know you, I wouldn't think it was you. You look way different from pictures. I've tried it a couple times, and so far no one has noticed. Deku sounded excited. I even took the train here today. I thought just changing my hair would be too obvious, but disguises are way easier than you'd think. Yeah? Otsuko slid into the booth across from him. For concrete proof that this was not a date, Otsuko needed to look no further than Exhibit A, Deku's hair. It struck her as quirkish, like he secreted an unknown substance from his head. No sane man would go on a date looking like that. And I was reading these studies done on recognition in the Journal of Psychology, where participants had more trouble matching the pictures of strangers when they wear wigs or glasses. It seemed small, right? But these people knew what the study was about, and they still had trouble. It really changes your appearance. I think it says more about how little people pay attention. You've gotten by with hats and wigs too, right? Like that one beady when you tucked in all your hair. Yeah, it's a good hat, but it's too hot in summer. By the way, did you know your eyebrows are green? Deku blinked once and covered his forehead in horror. I didn't even think. He was too much, and Otsuko dissolved into Snickers. 
Both you and Ida. Don't take everything so seriously. I'm just messing with you. Aren't you hungry? I don't know about you, but I came here for food. Uh, yeah. Otsuko hadn't been too hungry when she left, but the presence of tasty sushi rotating past their table quickly changed her mind. After a moment to get over his eyebrows, Deku joined in to pull plates off the conveyor belt. Otsuko commanded the touch screen. You like sea urchin? Click. Sweet shrimp? In fried shrimp? Click. Click. You know, I don't think I've been here before. There's a similar chain near Gunhead's agency, but this one's got way more options. Really? You should check the seasonal specialties. I think they have seared tuna right now, and it's pretty good. Two orders of seared tuna, then. Otsuko tapped away. Do you want something other than water? They've got tea, juice, soda. He peered over at the screen. Oolong tea? Iced? Got it. As for me... She scanned the alcohol selection. Beer on tap was both the cheapest option and Otsuko's favorite. Click. Oh, they have dessert. Chocolate cake sounds yummy. How much have you ordered? Some of it's for you, and don't worry. Women have a special stomach for sweets. The service was fast. They'd barely ordered when a waiter, who failed to recognize Deku, swung by with drinks. The automated sushi delivery wasn't far behind. Thanks for coming out on short notice, Deku said, handing out plates. I know it's a bit far from your place. It's my day off, so it's perfect. Otherwise, I'd be stuck at home with a grocery store bento when I could have... Otsuko selected a piece of seared tuna. Deku's most highly recommended seasonal specialty. I feel set up for failure when you say it like that. Mmm! She gave an exaggerated thumbs up with her mouth full. Glad you like it. It seems harder to get together with people now. Everybody lives far away or has a different schedule. Otsuko swallowed. I know what you mean. Like, I hang out with my coworkers sometimes, but it's different when you had to be professional. You see Todoroki a lot with work, don't you? Have you asked him about that video? Deku's head tilted. What video? What? Don't tell me you haven't seen it! His mute shake of the head sent Otsuko digging for her phone. It might not be the best thing to watch while eating, but whatever. Suyu and I were talking about it this morning. If she's watching it in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, you know it's popular. Oh, he has articles about it too now. She noted of the search engine results. Trending now. Heartthrob drinks demon smoothie. Here. She opened the video and pushed the phone across the table. Deku leaned over, a crease forming on his brow. He sipped his tea and bent down closer. What is he doing? I'm making a smoothie, Todoroki answered from the phone. If Deku hadn't been in disguise, filming his reaction would have made a million-view video by itself. He slowly tilted his head. His lips parted to say something and shut without a word. He pushed the fake glasses up his nose. He put the whole lime in? Peel and all? Yep. Is he going to drink it? With a straight face. You know, with all the views, I can't help but think, is this what it means to be a pro hero nowadays? Like, actual hero work is too ordinary. The world would rather see you drink nasty smoothies. Suddenly, Deku jumped to the buds of his own phone. His expression turned sharp when he checked the collar, and in one breath, Sorry, Uradok, it's the police, I got a ticket. He scurried from the booth, covered the dining room in a semi-jog, and was out the front door. In the video, playing for an abandoned seat, Todoroki pressed blend. The restaurant was both loud and intensely quiet at the same time. Sushi plates scooted along. Some kids chattered a few tables down. Ochiko retrieved her phone and closed the video. No need to waste data when she'd seen it before, and a weird publicity stunt was utterly irrelevant compared to whatever required the number one hero to be called. Police certainly didn't call off-duty sidekicks. She pulled up the news. Nothing significant had been reported yet, but villain attacks could happen fast, all destruction done before the media got in a word. Scooting to the edge of the booth, Watsuko stuck her head out in the direction Deku had gone. Of course, there was nothing to see. She didn't worry about Deku's safety so much as how fast he could get where he was needed. There was... No way he was coming back. Tomorrow, when the dust had settled, he'd send an apologetic text. She'd brush it off saying she completely understood. It was his job. She could handle the bill. She'd heard about the incident. Which she hadn't yet, but kept refreshing the news. For the moment, she scooted back into the seat and finished off her beer. Sorry about that. Bewildered, Otsuko was pulled out of infinite refresh mode. Deku sat back down in front of her. 
You're back? Is everything all right? Yeah, it's fine. His head bobbed in apology. It was an investigation update, not an emergency. They could have called the office. Oh, that's good, but if it was serious, you know you can leave. I won't mind. I know hero work comes first. Luckily, not today. Ochiko was relieved to see him back, occupied by conversation and food rather than villains. Between the two of them, they built a fine tower of colorful sushi plates. The audacious plan was to sample the whole menu, both because it was cheap, tasty sushi and for the gluttonous challenge of eating it all. Plate by plate, the tower grew. Here with Deku, consuming way too much sushi, she felt like they were back in high school again. Ridiculous considering the trouble a UA student would be in for underage drinking, but friends were what she remembered most about school. She had the weirdest urge to check the time, like they'd better leave soon or risk misking dorm curfew. Curfew came and went with no consequence. Back then, Deku chased the pro hero dream like a madman. If you saw him only in pieces rather than the whole package, he seemed crazy. Like training. He never stopped training. Or the scary level of detail in his quirk analysis notebooks. He knew the strengths and weaknesses of pros, villains, and his fellow students. She couldn't forget his dorm room, geeked out with All Might merch. It was excessive to begin with, and he'd only bought more. All because All Might was the hero Deku wanted to be. He was amazing. Like, really, really amazing. He became the leader, the strategist, the most steadfast, determined, and hardworking out of the country's pick of future heroes. And he was friendly, and cared about everyone, and had freckles, and he blabbered on and on about heroes, and told Ochiko her crook was amazing, and that sad movies made him cry. And just like that, Ochiko's own aspirations that had driven her to train, study, and successfully win a spot in Japan's most exclusive hero course were out the window in favor of a boy. She studied, practiced, and trained at a thousand percent because that's what Deku did. He made her want to push her limits, so she did. Ochiko's grades went up, both in practical hero skills and the standard high school subjects. An uninformed third party might call him a good influence. Now, her attempts to follow him seemed... not completely useless because she'd landed a decent job. She and Deku lived in different worlds. They were both pro-heroes, the same age, from the same school. Yet while she collected a paycheck, he was making the world a better place. Gravity wasn't a likely candidate for a hero card or a feature in a children's magazine, and she couldn't fathom needing a disguise to eat in peace at a family restaurant. If anything, the few times someone recognized her out of costume, it was a pleasant surprise. Which, to be fair, she much preferred leaving her hair as it was. Is it itchy? Huh? Your hair, Deku. You keep touching it. Sorry, am I bugging you? I'm not used to it, I guess. I'll stop. Good thing there wasn't an emergency. He wouldn't have had time to wash it. Ochko needed to stop taking everything he did personally, like passing the soy sauce. You need some? He asked before she noticed her sauce dish had gone dry. Deku leaned over with the bottle and dribbled a bit on her dish. So what if he had good manners? It might as well have been Ida or Tsuyu or a random person he'd met on the street. Knowing Deku got away with disguises was absolutely mind-blowing. The black dye made his eyes stand out. And when he went off on the upcoming UA sports festival, they lit up brilliantly green. Ochoko couldn't possibly mistake him for anyone else. There was a moment where the smile slipped off his face. He was thinking about something. She traced his line of sight to her glass as she sipped on her third beer this evening. Deku didn't touch alcohol. But since he was staring, you can order a beer if you want. His hands shot up in denial. Oh no, I can't. I could still get called out on an emergency. You know the alcohol laws, and I don't care for it anyways. He referred to Japan's strict codes on substances. Using one's quirk with even a hint of alcohol in the system could result in fines, jail time, and potentially cost a professional hero their license. Don't mind me, though. You're free to drink when you're not working. Always on call. Ochiko sipped at her beer. By now, a pleasant buzz hummed around her temples. I just thought, do you usually drink this much? I'm not used to alcohol, so I wouldn't know. Usually? Ochiko tilted her head. I don't usually go out and drink anything, but when I do, sure. 
Deku left his phone face up on the table. It graciously remained silent, but it was there. He'd be gone if someone called. Hero work came first. It occurred to Otsuko that maybe she shouldn't be here. Because even though she wouldn't blame him, a part of her wished he would stay. He didn't need such a distraction. Deku stood to add a sushi plate to the ever-growing tower. At this point, the top could no longer be reached while seated. Multiple shorter stacks of plates would have been the practical solution, but one treacherous tower made a statement. Otsuko had retired with an impossibly full stomach. A person could only eat so much sushi. Rice was the limiting factor. Fat clumps tucked under thinly sliced fish and employed to fill up customers as cheaply as possible. Also, beer didn't help. Deku pulled another plate off the conveyor belt. I was talking to Kirishima the other day and it hit me. People start getting married at our age. At 20? They're jumping the gun, don't you think? It's not too young for pro heroes. We're straight into the workforce right after high school, not in college like a lot of people. So, just practically, heroes can get married sooner. But it's more like... We're really adults now. Oh, like... When I moved into my new apartment, I thought, wow, I'm legally allowed to sign a lease without my parents? Except marriage is a much bigger commitment. Kind of like that, yeah. I don't know how exactly, but I thought I'd feel like a different person as an adult. You know, out of everyone I know, you're the last person I'd expect to say that. Otsuko dropped an elbow on the table and her chin in the palm of her hand, rattling the Tower of Plates. Maybe my cousin who spends all his money on video games. You seem to have it all together. But, Mina, you know, you don't get her pictures, right? I've seen some. Sent directly to your phone every day. I don't know what she's going to talk about when her wedding's over. I'm kind of jealous, though. They look so happy. Makes me want a boyfriend. Deckard tilted his head and frowned. As much as he could frown with octopus in his mouth. He swallowed. You want a boyfriend? Otsuko laughed once and cocked her head. Sure. Really? I never knew you were interested in dating. Why not? I guess since you haven't dated anyone before. I have too. I had a boyfriend about this time last year, for about three weeks, and he dumped me. Really? He asked again, now with wide eyes. I had no idea. You never mentioned it. I mean... I didn't want to tell anyone until it got serious, and it didn't. Sorry it didn't work out. Why are you apologizing? Three weeks is practically nothing. What about you? Haven't you thought about it? Or are you planning to be single for life? Not that I haven't thought about it, but... His eyes shifted to the side. I've got enough in my life right now, and I don't know the first thing about that sort of relationship. But I think it'd be good for you. You're fun to talk to and get along with just about anyone, so I'm sure you'll find someone. Two seconds of silence. She sat up properly, pushing herself away from the table. You think so? Of course. I might end up a little lonely if you get a boyfriend, though. It'd be weird for you to talk so much to another guy. So, he noticed. Deku being uninterested in dating was old information, he had a one-track mind, be the best hero he could be, and look where it got him. But the part where he noticed they talked enough to displease a potential boyfriend was new. He knew there was a line and he shrugged it off. She could only assume it didn't bother him. Ochko slipped her hands into her lap, and teasing the tiniest bit of skin between her fingers, she pinched herself. Despite Ochko's protests, Deku paid the whole bill. Yes, he understood she was fully capable of paying, and no, she didn't need to worry about being a leech. He deemed it a matter of courtesy. He invited her, after all. Deku also insisted on seeing her home. It's not always safe at night. Don't be silly. I'm a pro hero too, you know? You've been drinking. Ochiko flushed. Beer, not vodka. Go home. My place is completely out of your way. Humor me, please. He offered a half-smile, 
undue concern written all over his face. She could have told him to buzz off, to stop being so nice. This was where you mind your own business. Or better yet, she could have laughed at him. He had so little experience with alcohol, no, she did not need his help to get home. But she shut her mouth, because if she said one more word, it was coming out as a sob. Ochka swore she was not going to cry in front of him. He'd shower her with pity and do whatever he could to make her feel better. Any credibility she had as his peer would be gone. Deku sat beside her on the train, close enough to brush her knee. The rough fabric of his jeans tapped the skin on her leg, and there was nothing else she could think about. She wanted to touch him on purpose. She wanted to hug him, wrap her arms around his waist and bury her face in his shirt. He'd smell like sweat, laundry detergent. He wasn't the type to wear cologne. They were friends and absolutely nothing more. She wasn't supposed to be hoping for anything. Nothing was going to come out of it, and she knew better than to get dumb ideas. It wasn't fair to him. He liked her as a friend, and here she was, failing to keep herself in check like a freaking adult. Ochko wanted to wash his hair. She'd lather it up with something that smelled nice and massage his scalp until all of the crap washed out. Her fingers would be black, but she'd get his hair green and fluffy again. If he had a mind-reading quirk, there was no way he'd still be sitting beside her. Would he think her delusional? Creepy? A cold, hollow ache climbed up from her chest and lodged itself in her throat. Her ears rang from clenching her jaw. Her eyes were mercifully dry. Maybe it was the alcohol. Maybe she'd been this bad for years. Ochako folded her ankles to ensure their legs didn't touch. Barely two centimeters separated them. She needed a wall, preferably soundproof. Do you normally escort drunk people home? She ventured to ask. No, I call the police. It was standard procedure. If a drunk person wasn't violent, police were sufficient. Pro heroes didn't need to be involved. Right? Police would be way more practical. Otsuko laughed and wished to shrivel up and die. She couldn't do this to herself anymore. Alcohol had been a stupid choice around him, even as he assured her he didn't mind the extra trip. At least it forced her to be honest with herself. Get real, Otsuko. Her, him, and whatever existed in between them was going nowhere. The more she wanted it, the more she'd get hurt. When Deku said goodnight, she'd made up her mind to stop. Deku couldn't put a finger on it, but felt like he was missing something. His first instinct was to check his surroundings, which at a bi-weekly business meeting proved to be completely in order. He called his office to see if he had missed any appointments, which he hadn't. Then, checking his phone out of habit, he realized it was past 5 p.m. and Uraraka hadn't texted him all day. A picture he sent earlier, a cafe selling a matcha crepe cake she was sure to love, was marked as red, but she hadn't replied. Scrolling up, Deku saw that they hadn't talked much yesterday, and even then she'd been brief. A few words. An emoji. He knew she was at work, but sent a quick, How are you? It felt a little strange, seeing as she was the one who usually started conversations. Her reply came after midnight. Good, I've been busy, so I'm going to bed early. At least she was doing good. Deku should have been asleep, but more often than not, he lay in bed physically exhausted with a brain that refused to turn off. He'd gotten into a habit of calling Uraraka and letting her talk over his thoughts. But she needed to sleep too, so he said goodnight and scrolled through his newsfeed. Deku knew he and Uraraka talked a lot, but he didn't realize to what extent until tired and busy was all she said. He understood tired and busy. The hero profession inevitably came with long hours and calls in the middle of the night. Deku managed, but he had office staff, a robo-maid, weekly laundry service, and a subscription to a meal delivery plan. He imagined the workload weighed differently on her. Deku found himself opening their conversations and scrolling up, up, up. Uraraka was the type of person who talked about anything. Food, music, funny things she saw at the mall. It all filtered through to him. He'd gone to sleep early again, and he couldn't shake the sense of disappointment. 
especially since her days off had come and gone and she still hadn't said much of anything. June arrived, with its muggy weather and the first spontaneous text Udodaka had sent in two weeks. With her schedule change, she had to get up at five in the morning. Her request for no more late-night chats eliminated 75% of their usual conversations, but it was a message from her and Deka was ecstatic she'd said something to him at all. He'd been the one bugging her with highs and it's raining today's or whatever else he could think of. Starting a casual conversation was like catching a fish. He'd spend all day thinking of something she might like to talk about and as soon as he pulled it out of the water, it would flop around, gasp for air and die. Afterwards, Deca would read and reread his failed dead fish conversations, wondering if he was imposing, if she liked talking to him, if he was boring her or annoying her or she was simply occupied with something else. Was it weird that he was so bothered? It wasn't like she had an obligation to talk to him. Most of his other friends didn't chat that much. Apart from work, he might hear from Ida or Todoroki once a month, and it was normal. If either one of them texted him like Uradaka did, Deka would think something weird was going on. But he'd gotten so used to Uradaka, anything less than a constant stream of her unfiltered thoughts felt broken. The UA Sports Festival came and went. Deka had a ticket in the alumni section, where he met up with Ida. Ida liked to talk. Not like Uradaka. All business, but a mountain of business which demanded discussion so hardly a moment of quiet passed between them. Mixed in with the business, Deku asked if Ida had heard from Odoraka. And he had, a week or so ago. Apparently, she didn't chat with other people as much as she did with him. She didn't come this year, so Deku sent her a few pictures and tortured himself checking for the red notification. At his condo, he was back in their conversation log. Am I bothering you? He typed out the message and let it sit in the text box for ten minutes before deleting it. Her answer would be an automatic no, and he wouldn't know if she was lying. She didn't want to talk. That was fine. She didn't have to, but Decker wasn't sure, and it was killing him. But Araka didn't tell anyone if she was upset. Bright and peppy was her default. It made her fun to be around, something contagious about the smile that stretched out her cheeks. But no one could be like that all the time. She was bright and peppy when she caught a cold, and when she lost at the sports festival, and during their second year, right before she'd left campus for a few days, Deku had later heard that there had been a death in her family. Uraraka didn't bother other people with her problems. He tried not to overanalyze, but Deku couldn't help but think that something had happened. Their conversation history was right there on his phone, the contrast between old and new staring him in the face. It wasn't like her at all. Feeling nosy, Deku checked the area police reports and Gunhead Agency public records and concluded that whatever it was, it wasn't related to her job, which left personal. It gnawed at him. He could be wrong. Text messages only contained so much information, after all. But he'd had this feeling about friends before and regretted not doing more. He debated traveling by car or All Might style, a matter of time, sweatiness upon arrival, and whether to buy snacks before leaving or to look for something near her agency. It'd be rude to show up empty-handed. Afternoon clouds convinced Decca to pick Quirk over car, and some twenty minutes later, he entered Gunhead Hero Agency. The reception desk was unoccupied, so he pressed the call for assistance buzzer and waited. Between Decca's internships and various jobs, all Hero Agencies felt familiar. Above a brown leather couch... Coincidentally, the exact same one in his lawyer's office, heart, technique, physique, was displayed in bold calligraphy. A coffee table showing a neighborhood map added a nice accent. Photographs of Gunhead and his sidekick roster hung near the entrance. Aravity was one of six and the only heroine in the bunch, about the standard gender ratio in the industry. Her picture was from last year, evident because she'd updated her boots since then. As for the others... Deku knew way too much about these people. He heard more gossip about any one of these men than all of his office staff combined. Like Gunhead was obsessed with the sixth remake of Boys Over Flowers, where Zip, hanging to Uraraka's right, had a suspicious hairy mole on his back removed by a dermatologist. If they ran into each other, Deku thought it best not to mention that tidbit. 
A bright, hello there, pulled Deku away from the photo display. Gunhead waved, coming out from the back. Deku gave a, good afternoon, and a dip of the head. If he appeared natural, his extensive roleplay practice had paid off. My friend works here, so I came to say hello. Oh, you must mean a ravity. Yes, that's right. I've heard so much about you. She's upstairs, just came back from patrol. Give me one minute. A finger told Deku to wait. I'll send her right down. Thank you so much. Gunhead rounded a corner behind the reception desk and cheerfully called for a ravity. Considering that Udadaka circulated stories about Harry Moles, Deku wondered what Gunhead had heard about him. She'd be coming down now. Deku's grip tightened on the obligatory sweets he'd purchased en route. Cookies from the first shop he saw, packed in a brown paper sack printed with white checkers. On second thought, a Japanese confectionery would have been a better choice. Udodaka liked traditional sweets more, but mochi versus cookies was irrelevant if she didn't want to talk to him in the first place, which was why he was here. Deku needed to see if she was okay. And if the only issue was that she didn't want him around, he'd be out in two minutes. No, I've told you I'm not dating anyone. Who is it? Uraraka's voice was muffled from the top of the stairs. No need to be shy. You sure you can't guess? Bennett asked. I really don't know who'd come to see me. Footsteps approached the ground floor. Uraraka's eyes bulged when she saw him. Deku, what are you doing here? I thought I'd say hi. I brought cookies. With the best smile he could muster, Deku offered the sack. Um, thanks. She came over, wide-eyed and jaw-hanging, to accept the cookies. All the way from Tokyo? Well, no, actually, from the shop down the... On the corner by the convenience store? You've probably had them before. Uraraka set the sack on the reception desk. Not the cookies. You. Me? It's not that far. Her hands pulled in from her chest, and she looked over her shoulder. Hey, let's go outside. Uraraka ushered him out the front entrance. Outside? Okay. He followed. She ensured the door shut behind them. Sorry, it's kind of humid, but three of them are on the stairs listening to us. Deku turned sharply. From what he could see of the reception area, no one was there. See the wall behind the desk? Uraraka pointed. The staircase wraps around the back, and trust me, they're there. Do they normally do that? All the time. They're so nosy, it's like working with a bunch of grandmas. I've participated before, though, so I probably shouldn't complain. Uraraka stepped away from the agency for the shade of a ginkgo. A row was planted alongside the road, a small allowance of greenery for a concrete jungle. It's not too bad outside today, though. The clouds keep it from getting too hot. Hands folded behind her. She pivoted back to Deku. Gosh, I wasn't expecting to see you today. Did you have a reason to come by? Deku joined her under the tree. Well, I haven't been able to talk to you much lately. I thought I'd see how you were doing. Her eyebrows creased, lips parted. She took a few seconds to say, Really? Um, yeah. Is that not okay? It's fine, just... You came to see me? I mean, it's really out of your way. I can get around pretty quickly. It's not so bad. About 20 minutes with my quirk, and I need the long-distance training too. So, how are you? Oh, um, I'm fine. Nothing much is going on around here, which is a good thing, right? And so she talked and talked, and she couldn't stay out here too long because he'd called her out at work, but 30 seconds was more than Deku had heard from her in three weeks, and talked and talked like nothing had happened. Maybe nothing had. She'd gone to visit her parents and binge-watched crime dramas, and her schedule change had her exhausted. Those cookies he bought would be gone by tomorrow. She had had them before. An irresistible temptation when you walked by the bakery and the oven fresh aromas wafted out into the street, but the cream puffs at the same shop were to die for. I saw your pictures from the sports festival. You and Kirishima looked like you had a good time. You mean Ida? Right, Ida, what did I say? But she didn't look at him. Deku didn't notice till their eyes met and her skittered off towards the street. Trees, sidewalk, and traffic all had her attention. Anything to look at but him. After a minute, she brought her arms in front of her stomach where, with a finger and a thumb, one hand clasped the other's wrist. And Deku couldn't be sure, but something was off when she smiled. Her brow remained oddly still. Deku! Uraraka tilted her head and pointed a finger. I think you've been spotted. A chorus of giggles. Just short of gunhead agency, three wide-eyed middle school girls clung to each other's arms, 
gasping when Deku turned around. He was having a conversation. He buried his disappointment under a smile and a fat layer of guilt. Heroes encouraged people. Having fans was an honor. Squeaks and squeals followed when he waved, in which two girls pushed and the third shook her pigtails in protest, and then out she went. The girl came over clutching a school bag that, being so thoroughly covered in metal pins and badges featuring Shoto Todoroki, it clinked along the way. The side facing Deku was meticulously color-coded, split down the middle between fire and ice, and the zippers, loaded with Shoto keychains and a homemade plushie tied on a string, were ready to break. Hi! She stood in front of Deku and Uraraka, biting her lip, nervous eyes shifting between the two of them. Can me and my friends get a picture? Sure. With a wave, her friends scurried over. Uradaka volunteered to take pictures and held up one Shoto-themed smartphone after the next. Deku liked to consider himself used to this by now, but sometimes, fans went off script. Deku, do you know Shoto? Of course he knows Shoto. Shoto bad girl indignantly pointed to a metal badge. See, I've got them together right here. What's he like in person? The girl's eyes practically sparkled. He seems kind of serious, but he's a nice guy when you get to know him. You girls really like Shoto, huh? Yeah, he's the coolest. Giggles. And the hottest. Deku was grateful the girls didn't hover, offering their thanks for the pictures and giggling off on their way. The whole exchange had Uradaka in stitches. You're not the most popular with that demographic. I'm okay with that. Deku, it was nice seeing you, but I'd better get back. I've got a report to finish up. Wait, you're still off Wednesday, Thursday, right? If you have time, do you think we can meet up? Maybe. I'd really better get back to work, though. I can call you tomorrow. Following his conversation with Uradaka, Deku was incapable of anything more complicated than brute force and muscle memory, so he spent the rest of the afternoon at a training facility trying to break his record for a five-kilometer run. He was consistently faster than All Might in his prime, but fell short of his own best time by six seconds, likely because of a tailwind on the day he set the record. Regardless, the numbers were clear. Even one for all had its limits. Deku maintained his strength, but couldn't say if he was getting stronger or faster. Between rounds of running, he checked the time, and checking the time meant he checked his phone. Uraraka would be off her shift about now. What did it matter? She wasn't starting up conversations. It was at least 24 hours until she called him. Dinner was alone at his condo, braised pork and rice with a side of silent phone. Deku waited, their conversations on repeat in his head. The way she smiled and laughed and talked. Had she talked twice as much as usual? Had she forced herself to laugh? The only thing he was sure of was that if something had bothered her, he hadn't earned enough trust to hear about it. But then, as Deku was packing up dishes to return to the meal service, there was a buzz. One message from Otsuko Uradaka. He very nearly dropped his phone. Later, Deku would count himself an utter fool. Gullible as a puppy, dumber than a rock. Every word on his screen was an outrageous lie, including the header reading Otsuko Uradaka, who had no idea this message existed. Deku had just become the latest victim of a hacking scheme targeting famous pro heroes. As it was, the thoughts and worries already stuffed in his head seized the message it laid out before him and pulled it straight into his soul. His stomach dropped, blood drained from his face, and then his heart picked up, pounding. It made too much sense. The way she hadn't been talking much, the twenty times she said she was tired, the eyes that wouldn't look at him that afternoon, her at the restaurant finishing off three beers, in that moment, he'd do anything for her. Meddling when you didn't need to was the essence of being a hero, and Uraraka had sent him a desperate plea for help. He called her. On the third ring, she answered a tentative, Hello? Uraraka? Yes? Please, marry me.